Okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us on the Avid CNC live stream today. And we are so happy to be hosting Tim Sway. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks. Last time we tried to do this like a couple of months ago, and we all took acid at the same time, it sounds like, because. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> luckily, I figured out all the technical difficulties, fingers crossed. Uh, so we're coming through loud and clear. Sounds great. Uh, let me all uh, let you let me know if there's anything I need to adjust. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, we want to see where you all are. And uh, we're so thrilled that you're here with us today. So thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Tim. I'll be on the chat and answering questions there. And uh, yeah, let us know how all the audio is and uh, uh, excited to talk to you, Tim. Yeah, man, it's, been, it's nice to catch up with you guys again. Last time we saw you and I saw both of you in, in person it was pretty much the last time I could see anyone in person that wasn't uh, like directly related to me <laughs> because we were at the the maker. Um, what was the it called again? The Workbench Con. Uh, Work mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it was like a week after that that the whole world shut down. Yeah. So, uh, well, we, you know, Corey and I talk about that a lot. We are just so grateful that we had the opportunity to go to WorkbenchCon this year because we had, you know, I probably had six trips planned this year, and that was the only one we got in, and it was kind of, it wasn't like a last-minute plan, but it was certainly not uh, one that we had you know, extensively planned for, but it ended up being such a wonderful place to just get to connect with everyone, meet a lot of people I'd known for so long, you know, like we, we'd been working with you for a long time before that, and just being able to like sit down and, you know, have a meal, like watch a, a talk or have a beer, you know, it's just awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, Thanks everyone for coming. If you all have questions for Tim, please feel free to drop that in the chat here. Hi, Alice, thanks for being yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, and, and Pat, uh, one of my favorite customers up in Canada is asking about a t-shirt. Will Pat send me an email and we'll figure something out. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so it has been a little while since we get to see you and a lot of things have changed since then. Um, how, how are y'all managing over there at your shop? Uh, things are going pretty good here. And uh, I will point out that I, I can't see the chat cause I'm doing this from my phone in the truck. So I don't have a, a screen open. If there's any questions, um, you know, you can just let yeah, me know and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, yeah. So at the shop I've been, uh, I've been expanding. I've been taking over the whole barn. Uh, so it's like, I got a little more space in my workshop area now because I'm moving some stuff into just like sort of storage area, which has been keeping me dirty and hot. <laughs> and um, I got a few projects going on, but really the uh, most of my attention this summer has been going into this truck. And the last time when we were we started this, I don't think I had any of the walls up or anything on the interior of the truck. And now it's like it like looks like something. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, it feels like a room. Well, and the truck and. Uh, is almost an expansion of your business also, right? Because this is going to be your showroom and, and kind of the, the front store of, of New Perspective Music. Right. So if um, I'll, I'll give the quick overrun for anybody who doesn't know what I am doing or who I am or anything. But so basically, I, I have a workshop in this old barn that I love because it's in this quiet little valley in the middle of a, a sort of small city. But it feels like I'm like way away. The downside to it is it's not customer friendly because it's behind a house on a dead end street. It's and it's kind of, you know, it's just an old rundown barn. Um, so I was looking into potentially moving out of this barn and renting some space downtown, maybe finding an old abandoned factory building or something. And it was just becoming so expensive and um, and uh, exhaustive and also con like consuming um, because a main part of my business and my work is about, you know, leaving a smaller footprint. I work all with reclaimed and and locally sourced materials and you know, the idea of like heating and air conditioning or whatever this giant building was turning me off. So I decided to go micro, like tiny living. And I bought this old step van to turn into a micro, uh, you know, showroom, basically. Uh, so now if I have a client that wants to come to see my work, I can bring it to them. And uh, of course, it's a big gas guzzling truck. But you can't compare it to a car. You have to compare it to a building, right. you know. So uh, the, the footprint of it compared to a building is obviously nothing. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I've been outfitting this old truck and... Since uh, I basically make guitars, 
I thought it makes sense to try to find more uses for it. So I built a tailgate that folds down as a stage so people could use it as a performance venue outdoors. Um, I, I put some solar panels on the roof. Well, here, I can actually do sure. a, quick little, a quick little tour. Um, so I'll turn this around. And uh, you can see it's, it's basically uh, a 14 foot by seven foot interior that I did like, you know, reclaimed pallet wood walls. Um, this section here is storage that's going to double as seating and benches. It's in the process. Um, I've got some uh, hemp fabric. I have a woman named Carla out in uh, Montana or Wyoming. I forget. I met her online and she's sewing me these like cushions. We got some uh, nat all 100% natural latex foam cushions that are going to be there. There's going to be a back piece that will hang on a French cleat and come off and go on the floor. So it'll double as a sleeping pad. Um, and I've got um, this great recycled water bottle carpets that are going to go in here. Uh, there's my guitar rack, you know, storage, like a workbench slash retail space here. And then it all walks out onto this about seven square foot stage, uh, which is made out of all reclaimed uh, oak flooring. I just recently put this, uh, this sunshade up on it, too. So it gets you out of the sun a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I can actually hop yeah, down. Yeah, if you could, can you rotate the, the camera 180 degrees? Uh, for some reason, the footage is coming through upside down, but it's okay. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, is it? Is that, is that better? Uh, 90 degrees. Uh, it's not... There you go. So it's... Oh, uh, there... <laughs> 90 degrees. Oh, now we're getting sick. Okay, one no, more. one more. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. There yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah. See there. <laughs> okay. Awesome. <laughs> Cool. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll try to, I'll try to figure that out when I, when I go oh, back yeah, in. But so that's the whole, that, that's the whole idea here. This, um, this tailgate folds up. It's on, there's a winch that goes in, obviously the shade retracts. There's a winch that pulls it up and then I got some latches up there to latch it and stuff. I've driven a, a little bit with it and uh, it's all pretty safe. You know, Izzy, Izzy Swan, another member of the Abbott family is um, designing some stairs for me that are going to hang off this, that are going to fold up with the, uh, with the tailgate. Awesome. So I'm looking forward Fantastic. to seeing what he comes up with. And then um, I mentioned I have a couple solar panels on the roof that are powering this. Um, this is a lithium ion battery pack. And I've actually run a router off of it and uh, some other stuff so I can power music gear off of this while uh, the truck is completely off grid. And um, that is the plan. That's awesome. Yeah, mobile yeah, power is a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So I've got, um, you know, I've got a, a lot to do still. I've got some lights to put in and, and I got to finish the ceiling and everything. But um, we're getting there. You know, it's starting to look like something, which is cool. Yeah. Did we, did we lose Corey? Oh, no, he's nope, here. I'm here. Uh, I'm just smiling and, and uh, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing on the interior. Uh, do you plan on doing anything to the exterior, Tim? Or uh, are you yeah. trying to leave it kind of incognito? Um, I do plan on actually uh, taking my first trip with this truck out of state uh, next week, Monday. You're, you're upside um, down again, Tim. Oh, that's okay. All right. <laughs> Keep Perfect. people on their toes. Great. There we go. There. And I, I, lost, uh, I lost your visual, Corey. I don't know why. Okay. Um, I'm still here. Okay. Oops. <laughs> I got to set the phone um, back up. We got some good questions here. Someone's wondering if you've ever been in a band. <laughs> Which I'm sure is yes. That's a, it's kind of a running, it's kind of a running gag. That's a joke. Who was it that oh. said that? Uh, let's see. Who was that? Did I read that earlier? Oh, uh, Andy. Oh, and, and yeah. Andy Berkey? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Hey, Andy. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of a running gag because on, on my podcast, the Reclaimed Audio podcast, um, I apparently had said that, well, back when I was in a band, one too many times <laughs> in describing things. <laughs> so now it's become this, oh, uh, this kind of run. Uh, well, you get the, the yeah. true uh, believers here, you know. Um, awesome. Um, some, oh, Tommy, great idea. I'd like an Avid CNC onesie if it's available. Okay, I guess we have to order one for the uh, entire company now. That's a brilliant idea. We all need that. <laughs> Um, got a little truck tour. Uh, awesome. 
Well, let's let's talk about uh, CNC a little bit, Tim. I, I I saw recently you were talking about fluting toolpaths and uh, their efficiencies for doing some rough toolpath creation. Uh, and this is one thing I enjoy about CNC as an art form, as as it's a it's a progressive learning, right? We're always trying to find efficiencies and refine things. And so, uh, how did you? stumble upon fluting toolpaths and then like how did you leverage those into kind of a, a better process for yourself I, I have to name drop almost everything i know about cnc well for the the mechanical parts of it almost everything i know about cnc came from corey but then for the, <laughs> for the software part of it and the designing part of it almost everything i know comes from todd bailey who works for vectric now he's the design yeah. and make guy and um, so whenever I get stumped on something, I send Todd an email and I say, hey, how do you do this? And then he sends me back usually like a screen grab video and he shows me this, like, oh, click this, this and this or whatever. But he always does it. It's become a thing now where it's like almost like a pen pal type relationship. Um, and uh, so I was trying to figure out how to do a slant, you know, like a 90 degree angle. And I knew that I didn't not a 90 degree angle, like a 10 degree um, angle in something. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, he explained to me how the fluting toolpath work and how to do it. And, uh, and that opened up all these doors because, you know, guitars are not two dimensional. Um, but what I've been doing is cutting them two dimensional and then using hand tools to just give the slight contours where I wanted them. Because when I did a full 3D carve, it just took too long mm -hmm. uh, because now I had to run the end mill or the ball nose over the entire body and all these places where it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I was trying to do stuff where I would do just small sections to 3D carve, and I just wasn't getting it right. And then I, I was like, applied that fluting knowledge I picked up from something else that I was like, oh, if I just do a slight angle, I can rough this out real quick. And I have to sand it anyway, mm -hmm. so it'll sand out all the, you know, the lines of where the square, you know, end mill kind of goes, if you see any lines. And that works yeah. great. And then, and then the other thing was like, because there's a contour on the backside, um, you know, I would do, if I needed to do a two-sided carve, that's fine. But I was like, well, if I can route this all from the front, then I don't have to worry about flipping it at all. And then I can just, you know, just do that contour with, with an angle grinder in a matter of uh, less than a minute, as I showed in that mm -hmm. little story. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's originally when you get a CNC, the first thought is like, oh, now I don't have to do anything, you know, <laughs> right? And I imagine that there is some, some reasons to think that way, but I'm not a factory. Um you know, I'm just, I'm like a very small business. So it, it makes more sense to me instead of having that machine run and be noisy, like, well, if I can just, you know, create tool pads that do what the accuracy and all the, pardon the helicopter, um, you know, that, that, that do all the, the stuff that I need done, you know, that it can do quickly and more efficiently. And then I can do the other things like the, almost the artistic parts of it by hand faster. It just makes more sense to me. Yeah. Um, so it's like, you know, I think it was um, Mark Stagnolo, the, coined the term uh, hybrid woodworking, you know, where it's like mixing hand tools with, with power tools. It's like, I'm looking at it like it's like 21st century hybrid woodworking, you know, of not, it's like a CNC project is not a separate project from the woodworking, you know? Yeah. I, I love that workflow. And so I guess to clarify a fluting tool path, if you aren't familiar with it, Vectric definitely has some good tutorial videos on it, but essentially it's like a profile tool path. So it's a tool path that runs along a vector but you can set a start depth and a finish depth uh, of that tool path. And so it will uh, move and adjust your Z height through the move. And so you can create angled surfaces with 2D vectors. Right. It's like, it's like walking in a pool, how it gets slowly deeper and slowly deeper as you exactly. walk in. And, you know, and um, it's funny because like I, I'd seen that function in the software, but I didn't know what it meant. It's just like one of those words that doesn't necessarily like lend itself to be like super, to me at least as the non-machinist with no machinist training i didn't i didn't know fluting meant get deeper as it goes <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> yeah it's interesting yeah. how vector is really good at taking feedback and making adjustments to their software as there are things that you know are needed to be transferred from more traditional woodworking like fluting is kind of used in a lot of things like uh, banisters and furniture and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and is something that you can make jigs for you know it just takes more time but it's awesome that they can integrate all these little things and they're always continuing continually improving everything so I'm excited to see um, you know use all the updates in 10.5 and um, 
you know, all of that. Actually, it's funny. I I know you posted last week the um, uh, one of your most recent projects using the box joint gadget, and I uh, mm -hmm. I made a uh, some box joints um, uh, drawer boxes, and that's what I found that 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 is perfect for because it has some kind of reveal on the edges. Um, but you don't ever see that in a drawer box. You only see the inside of it. So I feel like that was another yeah. good use case for um, that gadget. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's one of those things like, um, you know, dovetails are like this like classic, like woodworking thing. And so there's something that's kind of fun about, about a CNC, like where it's like literally that simple, like click, click, click. And then the dovetail, like all the math is done. And, and uh, you know, it's almost like a little bit like, feel like a little bit dirty, you know, for doing it like you're cheating. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, again, it's like, you know, maybe five years ago or maybe a little longer, I would have been like, totally, I, I've said it before, like I was in that camp. I was like, well, that's not real woodworking. Like you got a machine doing that. But, um, but it, it's, what it does is like, if the machine does that, it elevates the craft. Like it, cause it, it, it takes your time away. Like the amount of time that you would have spent doing this thing that this machine can, do for you now you have that time to invest into other parts of your design or other parts of the artistry of the work you know, or, sanding. I, or sanding or sanding or <laughs> sanding yeah, that's what i end up doing it's just like i've created more sanding opportunities wow look at what i've done because right, I, I can cut more things now so now i have more things yeah, to sand <laughs> i have more exactly it's not that it takes more finish it's just i have more things to sand well, that's why you have friends and hire people to help with sanding. That's one thing I can't stand doing. But I do like to think about the CNC in a larger ecosystem. When there's another tool that does the job better, you might as well do that. You don't need to always CNC carve like this complex contour if it only takes you a minute to do it by hand. Um, you know, it's trying to pick the right tool for the right job and combining those things. And I also like to look at CNC through the lens of uh, lean manufacturing. And this isn't, mm -hmm. you know, lean concepts aren't necessarily just for production environments. It can be applied to your personal life, your shop life. There's a lot of different things. You just want to reduce waste. And waste is anything, you know, that for example, a client wouldn't be willing to pay for. So that's like the time that you have to walk to go get your plywood 20 feet away. But if you can store your plywood right next to the CNC machine so you can load it up easily, that is more efficient. So you're just trying to strive for more efficiency um, and uh, never run out of raw goods and that sort of thing. But um, when you don't have to do some certain menial tasks like cutting out all these box joints because does it really, you know, you kind of weigh your goals. What really matters here? Is it uh, me having these perfect joints that don't have a very tiny dog bone reveal on the corner, but because no one's ever going to see them? Or is it me uh, investing more time while that's running to go program the rest of the cabinet, for example? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's um, exactly what I've kind of come to. Like when I first got the CNC, you know, it was about learning how to use it. And then once I had a handle on how to use it, I was trying to just cut everything on it. And, uh, you know, it's like we had this discussion on our, our podcast a few weeks ago. It was actually Corey's uh, recommendation about a CNC podcast. And, you know, uh, like I could do everything in my shop if I just had your CNC machine. Mm -hmm. Like I could use it as a table saw and I could cut straight lines. I could level with it. I could route with it. I could do I could do everything with it. But it would take me forever to finish a project, yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, that's, you know, and, and then people, even from like a manufacturing standpoint, like having the CNC isn't necessarily like, oh, well, now I can make a thousand of everything at half the cost. It doesn't because some things it's just not faster at. Um, but it's about, you know, learning how to set it up in the assembly line, in the production line um, to to maximize its its space and its footprint. And I feel like I'm getting there. Yeah. You know, it is like, a lot of user workflow, I think, that can contribute to how yeah. fast something is able to run. Um, whether it's, you know, yeah. just having designated work holding. Corey and I talk about that a lot, how that helps increase efficiency and just practice, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's that's my next step, I think, is, um, and Corey and I have talked about that quite a bit, about building fixtures that basically just waste boards for specific functions. 
Um, so having a piece of MDF that's cut to a shape. The reason I haven't done that yet is because so much of my work is done with like reclaimed and scrap wood and stuff that my blanks, even though I'm making like the same size guitar body, my blanks mm -hmm. often end up being different sizes. And it's not a big deal. I could, I could cut them all down to the same size, but it's an additional step. Whereas if it's a couple inches longer than the last one now, mm -hmm. but and if, if I had a fixture, I'd have to go and set it up and, you know, but uh, it is definitely the, the next step for sure is having those fixtures. You know. Yeah, well, speaking of fixtures, we got a good uh, question here from Pete. Hey, Pete. Uh, Pete's asking, uh, uh, to shape a tapered arc on a guitar neck, uh, is that tough to learn in V-Carve? And so uh, uh, he's he's asking a little bit about the CAD side of doing luthier work. But for me, I'm also interested in, in the work holding of those, those kind of uh, uh, shapes that you do, Tim. And so can you touch a little bit about that workflow specifically around guitar necks? Sure. Yeah, guitar necks are um, are interesting because it's a two sided carve, and it's the way I'm cutting them. Most of the time, it's only a 3D carve on one side, so you can't necessarily do it in V carve. You do need Aspire to do the full radius. But basically, what it is in Aspire is it's called a two rail sweep, and mm -hmm. so you draw a line on either side of the profile of your neck, like you have all your neck math figured out. Mm -hmm. um, you draw a line on either side. And they have to be like the vectors or the, the start point and end point have to be on the same side. That's something you have to check. Otherwise, weird stuff happens. And then you you create the geometry of like a guitar sh neck shape, which is a traditional neck shape is called a C shape because it like the profile of it looks like the letter C. So you draw your C um, and then you it's apply it made from pirates. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> oh, pirates of the sea. Are... Right. Because it's made from pirates, um, all, all good tone pirates. Only use tone pirates. Tone pirates, yeah. <laughs> but um, so the um, yeah, so you you create the the letter C <laughs> shape, and uh, you apply that to the rails, and then you know you have to do some adjusting and some math and stuff to get it perfect. But but that will create that arched shape all along the neck. And now what happens is since the guitar neck is a little skinnier on one end than the other end, um, that and you, if you apply that shape, sometimes I'll, I'll create a small C and a large C for each end and I'll apply mm. one to each end, but the, the math, it'll sort of get bigger and thicker and wider as it, it goes. It tapers it, it for you. Yeah. Right. It just sort of does it for you. Um, and so then you have to cut it out. But now you can, before I was using, uh, Aspire, I was, I was messing around with this stuff. I was just cutting 2d necks out where I do all kind of like we were just talking about with the guitar buddies. I would just do all of the 2d cuts and all of the shapes. Uh, in two dimensions, um, and then just use a rat and, and, and create that C shape by hand, which yeah. I still do, you know, like, uh, sometimes uh, I still end up doing that sometimes too. I might do a little bit of final shaping and profiling, but using a draw knife or a rat. So if you like, if you only have V carve and you have like, or maybe if you're using like, um, an inferior CNC machine, I won't mention any names, but something that can't really do this heavy hardwood contour cutting, that's going to mess up. Um, like certain machines that I've experienced, <laughs> just do it in 2D and then um, and then you know do the rest by hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or uh, V Carve, you can do 3D tool paths in V Carve, but you can't create the 3D model. So if you right. found a 3D model of a guitar neck, you could bring that into V Carve and then you could uh, 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 machine that, but you couldn't modify that model except for stretching it. So you can stretch in V Carve, but you can't modify the individual elements of the 3d shape oh so, so you can import an stl like a yes model. exactly so you can bring in an stl of a guitar neck and but that i don't feel like would create as clean of tool paths as aspire would uh and that's because uh, uh tool path creation is based off of vectors and and uh, bringing in an stl and moving it around you might dirty up those vectors a little bit or create more facets uh, that yeah. the, the system is trying to trace. So, but you know what else you, you could do um, is uh, talking about fluting. Is that there's no reason why you couldn't rough in the guitar neck by creating some very um, precise fluting tool paths along those axes. Yeah, uh, which like right now sounds like a lot of fun to try. Honestly, <laughs> like to see how good I could dial that in. Well, and that would be a real easy way to make the uh, a fixture for holding a neck on on the is just creating a fluting toolpath that wasn't necessarily 
perfectly saddling the neck, but it would be enough contact points where it would hold it square. So you could come back and do uh, your uh, fretboard work on the other side on that, the, you know, having a contoured face. Yeah, that's, um, I did, I did cut out of a two by four once I cut like a contour block to use and, uh, I ended up not liking it. Um, I just use a piece of foam. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, <laughs> right? Cause it's fast and, and, and easy. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I've seen some very interesting jigs like that, but to, to talk about the, the work holding too. Um, so with the guitar neck, you know, the, the top side, like the fingerboard usually gets cut separately and glued on. Um, mm -hmm. But so you do have to cut, make cuts on the top side the, that the fingerboard goes on, um, you know, and you have to maybe, you know, put a spot for your tuning pegs and stuff and uh, drop that down a little bit. And I do all that in two dimensions, um, you know, slot for the truss rod. Um, and so then I do where I, you know, I flip it over like a two sided carve uh, and I have indexing pegs to make it so it lines up properly. Right. Um, but what I do for that, because I, when I, sometimes I want to cut my neck all the way through and now it's like to put tabs and stuff that gets kind of weird and tricky. So I just use like a, you know, a whole ton of hot glue <laughs> and I cover that, that neck with it when I flip it upside down. And now I can cut the entire neck out without worrying about tabs or anything. And I can get pretty close to where I want my final shape to be right on the machine. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have to, you know, just use a, like a putty knife or something to pry it off of the, the workbench. And um, I think it's alcohol. I have to, I always have to look every time, but alcohol will soften up that, that glue and, and remove mm. it from the fingerboard. Then, so you don't, you don't have big globs of this glue to deal right. with. Do you put the like blue tape on before you put the hot glue? Uh, no, when I do the hot glue, I just do that right to my, my wasteboard. Mm -hmm. But I do a lot of times, like when I'm doing the fingerboard, for example, uh, and some other smaller stuff, I will do that. The blue tape, right. super glue blue tape on the work yeah. and stick it down. That's like my favorite method for. Yeah. I love that. It's so much better down. than That's putting awesome. foam tape on your material and then trying to get that off. It's awful. Yeah. Um, is he here? Yeah. Is he here? He says, Hey, what's up? And, hey. uh, I was just talking about you. Is he where are my stairs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm excited to see is he stairs. Is he so good at designing like foldable modular custom, you know, things. You saw those tables that he made for the, um, the hydroponic uh, vegetable garden that folds. It's like a, it's like a yeah. shelf and then it folds into a table mm -hmm. and you don't have to take anything off the shelves. Is when I saw that, I just, I, I texted him immediately and I was like, Izzy, I need stairs. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't think like that. There's also like <laughs> a, he made a foldable wall shelf that goes into tiny houses. So that might be another good addition for, for your space. Um, yeah. I, I saw that and liked it too. And um, I was thinking about maybe doing something like that for retail display space in here. Um, but I don't know if I'd need it to be a table ever. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, hey, but, it, but it's just too cool for school. Yeah. So um, we also want to say, hey, uh, thanks everyone who's just, who's been joining in and like who's been here. Phil, hello. And uh, let's see, we, I think we might have another question here. Um, so I think that we have a lot of longtime fans and people who have known you for a long time and maybe some people who um, have, you know, who are new to you. So can we just give a quick like introduction? I'm sorry we didn't do that at the beginning. Um, just a little bit of background on kind of your mission and the things that you do and things that you make. Sure. My name is Tim Swan. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, na my name is Tim Sway. And um, I am, uh, I was once in a band. <laughs> uh, I'm, a ret I'm a, like a, a retired musician. I was, uh, I was a musician most of my life. That was, you know, how I would have identified or whatever. I, I played music for uh, a living for, you know, I was doing day jobs and playing music. And I got to the point where I didn't need a job anymore. And I was just playing music for about 15 years and um, in all sorts of aspects. But what happened was, uh, well, one thing that happens when you play music for a living is that you're generally speaking just broke all the time. And so I, uh, I was very often, you know, very frugal and um, picked the trash a lot and the curb a lot, you know, finding used furniture I'd fix up and, and use. And then I started getting kind of good at that and selling it. Um, and then I started to just enjoy that more than playing music. Music started to feel like a job. So I quit playing music because I didn't want to hate music, you know. 
Um, so I quit playing music and I started doing this full time. And it, it started as making furniture and doing some custom built ins and, and, and art and whatnot. And uh, then it turned into like after a couple of years, I was like, well, I want to start making guitars because, you know, music was such an important part of me. And I, I started to not hate it again. <laughs> so I started making guitars. And now that's pretty much all I do is make instruments. But still with this um, trash picking reclaimed like ethos, it's, um, you know, where I, I, I became an environmentalist out of like financial need, uh, not out of like necessarily some, uh, you know, some higher calling. But that higher calling has sort of come to me as I've learned and, and grown and understood uh, the impact of of us, you know, on the planet. And um, I try to, you know, not only reduce uh, my own personal impact, but uh, encourage other people to do the same and uh, show that it doesn't have to be like some grandiose thing. You don't have to, you know, like homestead and or become a hermit in the woods or live in a yurt. You can just like live a normal sort of like I get to I get to drive around in this big gas guzzling truck, but I can feel good about it because it's not a whole entire mm-hmm. building. You know what I mean? So there's like about just sort of thinking about, um, you know, rethinking our approach to consumption and and waste and guitars makes perfect sense for me because um you know it's as an artist it's i can make a piece of art that has all of this impact and this message that i want about the materials that it's made out of and then i can hand it to someone else and go here go make some more art with it and um and you know i i watch all these people singing their songs about saving the earth and they're playing these instruments that are you know i like i can identify the wood and the the practices that went into the the deforestation to get it and this and that and it's like ah you know it's kind of cringing uh so like now i'm like trying to like give people an opportunity to like well here's something like you you know it's made like the right way right and go go sing about saving the earth and feel good about the instrument that you're playing while you do it we just kind of need those options pioneered in many different industries for individuals to be successfully sustainable on their own individual level um i mean right I was making, I was making coffee tables mm-hmm. for rich people, you know, which is, which is a good living. And, you know, I remember like one time, like delivering a coffee table to a person and they'd be like, Oh, I love this so much. I was like, Oh, I, I made this out of the tears of fallen unicorns and whatever, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, get, and, and like, this is great. Like, I can't wait to, I can't wait to throw away my old coffee table. And it's just like, Oh, Oh, that's right. When you work for that class of people, you're not actually doing anything. They're just consuming more. Um, musicians like cherish their instruments you know, and, and they, they, when they buy a new guitar, they don't throw the old one away. And uh, there's definitely more guitars on the planet than there need to be, I'm sure. But, um, but it just made more sense to me as a, as a statement piece Mm -hmm. that I can, you know, I can, here it is, like, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, make something beautiful. People are, you know, they're not going to be able to like, oh my God, that was made out of garbage. You know, that was made out of something that your neighbor's firewood pile or like that old building they tore down. And now it goes out and it lives in the hands of another artist. You know? Yeah. I mean, that seems like an, the intersection of a lot of your passions. So it's cool to see that. Um, right. And the truck is a way to kind of bring that out there, too. You know, like the whole truck is the story now where I can go and I can I can take these guitars. I can drive somewhere. I have a solar panel. And, you know, we have plans to do some videos of that, too, on my YouTube channel. But, you know, have that band play off the sun yeah. on reclaimed instruments off the back. Yeah, of the bring truck, it to the people. Know? I mean, how how cool yeah. is that? So like, you know, just, you know, when the truck's not in use, I could just go to the farmer's market if, if we ever have farmer's markets again, yeah. <laughs> you know, but you know, just go like, you know, like just go set up and, and just like, you know, let the guy that plays guitar there play off my stage or whatever. And, you know, here, plug into this. Yeah. Hearing, hearing you talk about that, Tim gets me excited about some of the conversations I get to have with potential clients. And, and they ask me, well, Corey, how can I make money using my CNC? And I respond with, well, what do you enjoy making? Who do you want your customer base to be? Because it shouldn't be about you uh, replicating this exact business model because it will be really profitable for you. I want you to leverage the CNC to be involved with a community and working with materials that you naturally have an interest and passion and you want to present exceptional value to. That is who you should be trying to leverage this machine towards selling or making a product for. So it isn't just about, you know, how can I make the most money out of the machine, but more, how can I use this machine and my skill sets to work with the clients and the materials that you really enjoy working right. with? Right. How can, how can I make my life better? Right. Yeah. You know, how do I want to, I was just at, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. you just want to show up to your shop every day and be excited about the things that you're making. You know, there's so many options and paths and, um, 
you know, productive things you can do with your machine, um, both financially, but then also just, you know, um, in terms of your career path, but the, and your passions, there is overlap in many of those different things, no matter mm -hmm. kind of which, wh wherever you're coming from. Um, uh, yeah. I, I just, I just got to go to, um, to Kaizen insert shop. It's, uh, yeah. oh, I nice. found over, uh, that was, it was in my video and, uh, you know, my buddy Brian runs that. So mm -hmm. he was, a uh, Hey Brian, he, love yeah, your work. Here, I, <laughs> um, he was doing, you know, installs and cabinetry and all the like types of traditional construction work, but he's also selling tools on the side. He's very entrepreneurial. Then he got into this Kaizen business where he's cutting inserts for toolboxes, um, that, you know, so the tool fits perfectly into this foam and, and mm -hmm. it turned into this incredible, I had no idea, the, the business. And so the first thing I noticed when I, when I walked in there, I was going down, because I used some scraps of his foam for my guitar stand back there. Mm -hmm. and, um, the first thing I noticed when I walked in was this, this 4 by 8 Avid CNC. And, he, you know, and he, I was like, oh, I was like, this is a great machine. And I looked down and down the hall, he's got yeah. another one. He's got a 5 by 10 Yeah, they have two, yeah. right? And then he had a couple, mm -hmm. right, and he had a couple smaller machines too. And they just, these things just cut foam all day. He's got a, the vacuum on it, which is perfect for what he's doing because it's right, light. Yeah. And, you know, and um, yeah, he did, he just like these machines. They just, like I never would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, oh yeah, it doesn't. It could do. So it's like it can do anything. Like whatever you're into. Like you know. And then you see these guys like the the foam sculptors that are making like art with them and stuff. I see that Sammy, you shared. Oh yeah, that there's stuff. yeah, uh, Mathscaper. Oh my gosh, so yeah. awesome. There's so many, oh, we have, so cool. we're so fortunate to have so many, such a diverse, um, you know, career diverse material and uh, really wonderfully supportive community um, of makers who are using our machines and just participating in this. It's so awesome. Um, I just want to answer a few questions here uh, or bring them up. Um, somebody asked about if you could upgrade from VCarve Pro to Aspire. Um, yeah, Pete answered that, but I did just search for it, and Vectric has an upgrade store. Uh, so if you just go to Vectric's mm -hmm. website, they have an upgrade path from uh, VCarve Pro to Aspire and that sort of thing. So they can help you out with that. Um, what I love about the Vectric software, uh, and I, I work with them all the time, uh, you can start at like Cut 2D which is basically V carve light. It does a, a lot of the basic stuff. Um, and that's, you know, a relatively inexpensive piece of software, but you can start there and you can keep upgrading from there all the way to Aspire. So as your business, kind of like with the Avid CNC, it's mm -hmm. that same model. You can buy the four by two like I have. And then as your business grows, the machine can grow with you. Uh, and Vectric does that with the software. They have that same mentality because they know it's expensive. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't make sense necessarily to buy that software right out of the gate if you're in, and have that huge overhead sitting on your business right from the start. Start with Cut 2D for a couple hundred bucks. Start cutting and making stuff and selling stuff mm -hmm. and then upgrade as yeah. you know. Well, while we're on the topic of Vectric, uh, Tim has been doing a series of uh, design and make projects on Vectric's channel. And a lot of times it has a video on Tim's channel paired with it. Um, so if you're interested in some... Uh, projects there's been some really amazing ones over the last you know year or so or a few months especially i really like the um uh mini was it kind of like a mini guitar uh project oh yeah 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 that one's cool um it's yeah that one works it's i still want to develop that some more but what i i love that because um it gives me an excuse every other month to just experiment with mm -hmm. the cnc and yeah. uh like, you know, I just put out the video, the, the box one that was from supposed to be back in May, but then that the trip to Maker Central got canceled. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the first time I'd used that, that dovetail box, you know, feature. And then um, right now I'm working on my one for September. Uh, I'm trying to get ahead of the game and um, I'm making a model of this truck. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Out of wood. It's like it's, it's just like an excuse to, to sort of play and create. But what I would really recommend is if you go to their channel that there's other people like Todd, who I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. and Becky who works there that make projects for Vectric users that are actually like amazing. Cause I, I'm like the, uh, I'm, I, I just go in and play. And, and that's like kind of what they wanted is they wanted me to go in and be like, Oh, I just found this piece of garbage. I'm going to put it on my CNC. And like that, I'm not there necessarily as like the guy that's like the end all be all CNC user. I'm more like mm -hmm. entry level when it comes to that type of stuff. Um, but there's some, like the, what you can do with the CNC, like, you know, it's like watching these guys and, and what they do. They have a really great range of projects for different levels and 
Right, you can start, they have lots of 2D projects or cut 2D and you can kind of work your way up. So they have something for no matter which um, kind of software you're working with. Um, Izzy yeah. wants to know yeah. how many guitars you build in a year. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's, geez, I mean, I, I would, I would guess, I would say so far, maybe if I look at this year, I've probably built 30 of them. Wow. Maybe, but like, but that's counting like, that's counting like some of the, like the little ones, <clears throat> some of my experimental ones, you know, Those count. and some, some that I maybe haven't finished <laughs> all the way, but they're, yeah, ninety percent of a guitar. Uh, yeah, fifty maybe. You know, I got a couple on the bench right now. I'm working on, you know, counting those. But you know, that some of them are, you know, mostly what I'm doing now are custom builds. Like I, I make stuff to stock the truck and stock my online store, um, and I have these like these kits and stuff that I've been messing around with and selling. Um, but uh, most of the stuff I do is like custom work where people are like, hey, I, I like that thing I saw you make. Can you make me like that? But this, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and I'm starting to you know, knock on knock on what I'm starting to like get enough sort of traction to where that's been keeping me busy. And and I'm getting these gigs like I, I just made two instruments that I'm counting as guitars, but they're not. Uh, one is an, uh, an air who, mm -hmm. uh, which is a two string Chinese fiddle. Um, and I made an electrified version of it, like with a fingerboard, like all this, like, like the video will be coming out hopefully soon. And then I made a, a pipo, which is another Chinese instrument just for this, this band in New York. Um, so people are calling me with like, they're like, they're like, Hey, he does weird stuff. I have a weird idea. Can you, yeah. and it, like, like when she first contacted me about the, the uh, pipa, as I got a message on Instagram, it's like, Hey, I love, I just saw this instrument you made. I love it. Can you make me a five string electric pipa? And I, I, so I Google what pipa is. I see it's this traditional Chinese flute. And I was like, I don't even know what you want, but yes, I'll make it. That's like, awesome. You know, absolutely. I mean, that's fun because like, it always pushes I, you to be more creative and learn new things. I always think it's nice to learn on um, other people's crazy ideas and projects. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because I have, a, I have a ton of my own crazy ideas that I want to do. But my favorite things are when someone comes up with some crazy idea that I never even heard of. Um, like I've got, I've got one. I, I don't. I don't know if I should talk about it publicly, <laughs> but I, I got, I got this one from a guy last night that was just like the, it's like the dumbest and greatest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so uh, I, I don't want to talk yeah, about yeah. it yet. We'll because it's report potentially back once it's for made. Someone. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, it might, it's like a surprise, but I was just like, he's like, can you make that? And I'm like, my, I just start typing yes before I even think about it. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'll figure it out. You know, that's, that's, I mean, how much fun is that to make that your job? It's not the most profitable way to work because you end up giving a quote based on what you think it's going to take time wise. And it always takes twice as long, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but that's okay because you're spending your life like learning and growing and creating new things. Like I'm much more interested in that than getting rich. You know? Yeah. Uh, Narwhal Labs has joined us. Thanks for being here. And uh, I know you're, you're going over there next week, huh? Yes. Yeah. Taking the truck out of the, the, state for the first time monday and i'm driving down to see jeff over at narwhal labs and we're, we're talking about that earlier about the exterior of the truck mm -hmm. um we have some plans we're gonna we want to do some paint work there we're gonna um paint part of it and then i also have my buddy derek from square splinter on youtube and his day job is in a sign shop and i'm working mm -hmm. with him to do a 14 foot long rollout vinyl nice. uh side with a with a like a 10 foot long picture of a guitar and my logo and all this stuff. So that's awesome. I'm going to do that. But then, I, but then I also wanted to do sort of my DIY reclaimed type thing to the exterior of the truck. So we're going to put those banners up, but then I have some plans to do some, some cut letters um, out of like wood and stuff. I have a fun project I'm going to do for the grill of the truck. Uh, it's going to be sponsored by Arbor Tech. And I'm going to pull the whole grill off and make a new frame for it. And then instead of having just like metal or plastic bars, I'm going to put in wood ones that I'm going to carve like a marimba. So you can actually play it like mm. in front of my truck. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, yeah. awesome. I have like some kind of little mount to have like drumsticks that are like chained to the bumper. <laughs> so I've been driving down the highway with like drumsticks. Maybe the windshield chain. wipers. Maybe they'll oh. they'll be on the windshield wipers, and you could pull them off there. That's a, not a bad idea to do like a, a quick connect. 
Yeah, I can't see that being a problem in a rainstorm. No, no, it's, those don't need to function. <laughs> yeah, that's details. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Tim, we're, we're getting close to the time here. And one thing that you've been executing on for a long time, and I feel like with a very high level of execution, and that's homeschooling and digital fabrication teaching to, to, to your kids. And so uh, I guess... Do you have any tips or tricks when we talk about people who are getting more comfortable with CNC machines and then and then teaching the younger generations on how to leverage that? Have you found anything in regards to workflow, whether you just kind of let Vance pick the project himself or you put a project in front of him and guide him through that? Or have you have you had any light bulbs turn on, uh, maybe not for Vance specifically, but just teaching digital fabrication to the younger generation? Well, I. I have to admit that I'm I'm slacking on that with Vance. Um, so Vance has been, you know, in my shop since he was a, a baby. Like, yeah. you know, he's always been involved. And his interests, you know, he's 10 years old now, and his interest, you know, waxes and wanes um, with the shop. Sometimes he's really into it. Sometimes he's into other things. Um, he's done a lot of stuff with me with the, both the CNC and the laser, but he hasn't done as much with me. And, I, and I've been slacking on the, the the computer part of it, like the actually creating code and designing mm -hmm. on the computer. Mm -hmm. When we go to Narwhal Labs next week, um, Vance is going to do a project there with Jeff. That uh, Vance picked the idea and Jeff did like a lot of the grunt work and put it together for him. And so that's something I'm excited about is that um, Jeff is very good at that type of work. And so I'm hoping that like he can light a fire like and he's going to, you know, show Vance what he did. And I think that's going to get Vance excited and, you know, and then sort of Jeff's going to be like, no, you know, go grasshopper, go, yeah. you know, yeah, off into the Padawan. world and use Tinkercast, <laughs> whatever, you know, so and I'm going to use that as sort of a launching pad to get him more into the digital side, because now that he's older and he's, I mean, he can definitely video game like a pro, so I'm sure he can figure out, you know, <laughs> you know how to do some kind of digital fab, but he's, um, yeah, he understands like the, the machine side of it, um, you know, like I've had him, you know, involved in, you know, he's watched me design and then the machine side, like he, he zeroes it out. He's, he straps stuff down. He's, you know, he's very good at that. And uh, my, my advice though, for that, for whether it's digital fab or just anything in general with like homeschooling, which I guess everybody is doing nowadays at homeschooling with the kids and stuff is um, to make the education relatable and interesting to the kid. Um, I get people write to me all the time when they see Vance in the shop working with me and, you know, they're like, how do you get him interested in this? And, uh, you know, I, I always just say, well, he's interested in what we're making. So that makes him interested in. It. So like, if you, you know, you want to get your, your 12 year old kid off the, off the, the Xbox and in the shop and he has no interest in it and you go, come on, son, let's make a birdhouse. If the kid doesn't care about birds, that just sounds horrible. You know, like, but if you say, Hey, let's make a, let's make a wood holder, for your Xbox controller to sit in when you're not using it or like a charging station or something like that. Something that relates to their interests. Yeah. Now all of a sudden there's a reason for them to want to go there and it's not just a deterrent from their interest. It becomes part of mm -hmm. their interest. You know, that's always like, so right now Vance is into, you know, he's into video games right now. Uh, of course, because every child is, I guess, but he's into um, like wheels, like in moving vehicles and stuff. So like he loves coming and working on the truck, but not, necessarily the cnc side of it he's more into that and then we have like a this, i picked up this hundred dollar tractor mower um and i pulled the i pulled the mowing deck off of it and so he's like got a, a, a cart for that thing and i have him hauling stuff around the property for me he's that's into awesome. that like driving and you know physical stuff so that's like oh that's where he's at right now so let him do that and and then when he wants to make something for the for one of these things it's like okay let's let's go make it you know well, a, a wonderful he, thing about gaming is, you know, you have a bunch of characters and whether it's a laser cutter, a 3D printer or, or a CNC router, uh, being able to cut or uh, give those characters physical form uh, could be something that would be really relatable to someone who has a kid uh, who's really into video games and are trying to get them into the shop. It's like, well, when you say make a game controller holder, you know, carve the characters, cut the characters, print the characters, uh, put the carrot in front of them and really encourage them to that this isn't woodworking is separate from your gaming world that they can intertwine. That's a really good point. Uh, you know, and, and cosplay is a, you know, it's a big thing as well, which is um, yeah. the, the project, 
project that Vance is doing over at Narwhal Labs is basically that. It's a, it's a prop from a video game. Cool. And uh, I've seen what Jeff came up with, and it's, like, it's amazing. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. And, uh, and Vance is going to be, like, it was Vance's idea. He said, hey, why don't we make this thing? Um, and then we kind of were like, okay, we're going to make it. But we went and started to set up the groundwork for him. And now when he sees it, he's going to flip. He has no idea how awesome it's going to be. And, uh, and that's going to get him. That's you know what I'm hoping will be the carrot that will get him into the digital fab side of it. So when Jeff yeah. is showing him this, this, and this on the computer, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to click. Because he, he knows the, the tool side pretty well for a kid his age, like mm-hmm. you know, the, the manipulating and stuff. And he knows his abilities. Like, you know, when you're 10 years old and you make a shape out of a piece of wood, it might not look good to you or I, but to him, if he made it himself, you know, it, it, he's proud of it. And, uh, and that's, I mean, I even look back at stuff I made 10 years ago compared to now, like, you know, my, your skills are always growing and developing. And so like letting him do that with the digital side mm-hmm. too makes sense. Yeah. Right. You know, you can't just, but then there is that instant gratification of like 3d printing in particular, mm-hmm. you know, how fast that can happen. So it, it's interesting. It's, you know, it's a brave new world. Yeah. I mean, the perspective of where you are at when you're 12 and then, you know, when you're 18 and then when you're 25, you know, it just keeps your world keeps growing. But it's so interesting to look at where they are and where their interests take them and how you can integrate that. Um, that's really awesome. We have uh, some folks theorizing about what your favorite podcast is. Can you tell us what your favorite podcast is? Some Someone asked. Uh. Well, I mean, of course, my favorite podcast is mine, Reclaimed Audio. Reclaimed Audio. Okay, top three. <laughs> <laughs> but top three, um, geez, I, I don't know. I have a lot that I listen to during the shop. I like, um, I don't, I don't really listen to. I admit that I don't listen to a lot of the woodworking podcasts. So um, I tend to, when I'm in the shop, listen to uh, like nerdy stuff, like like Radio Lab and 99 Percent Invisible this classics. American life, like those kind of like, yeah, like I, I guess the classics, I listen to a lot of those types of, um, I listen to, I've been listening to Bill Nye. He has like a science rules podcast. Uh, and just like, you know, these like deep dives into nerdy yeah. stuff, I guess is what I listen to. Awesome. <laughs> I will, I will recommend uh, the digital fabrication experiment DFX. Um, I always say DXF, but DFX and, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, you know, very CNC Digifab focused uh, podcasts and excellent hosts. Um, all right. If anyone has some last. Yeah. And I love uh, how I built this with Guy right. Raz. Uh, that's a really fun. Uh, I, I love the idea of talking about scaling and growing. And uh, I think that, you know, he reviews that on, on every, every podcast that he does. Yeah. I forgot about that one. I've listened to a few of those. That was, that was pretty good. Yeah. Um, one other thing I guess maybe we were really excited about was, um, so you have your, uh, four by two machine in your shop now, and we gave a new home, uh, to your bench top machine. Uh, can you tell us about where that went? Yes. Yeah. So I, my first Avid machine was the two by three bench top, um, which I said when I got that, I was like, this is the biggest, best machine that there is. And I'll never need anything bigger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that went to uh, Brody and Cody Young, uh, the Young Makers, and they are brothers. Uh, I think they're 13 and 11 or 10, um, and they, they don't live too far away from me. They're in uh, Massachusetts. Their their parents are, are makers, and they have a big, you know, professional wood shop. But these guys have, like, their own sort of side business, like, thing that they've been doing and trying to grow with social media. Super mm-hmm. nice young guys. And um, so they came down and picked it up. And uh, they've been using that machine, which is the absolute perfect home mm-hmm. for it because it's their second CNC machine. And it's like, it's the perfect second CNC machine, the, the bench top Avid, like, I mean, it's the perfect first CNC machine too, but people don't know that they look, you know, like they, they think they're going to buy the cheap yeah. one first and then they go, Oh, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta learn. Yeah. Like that's, you know, that's how you learn. Um, but it's like absolutely the perfect second, maybe even final CNC machine, honestly. Um, and uh, I was, when I got the four by two, I just, you know, I was like, Oh, I'll be using both. And, and we talked about that for a while about having me run both. And I just don't have the electricity or the, the volume to really need mm-hmm. them. I was like, I think mm-hmm. I, I think I'd rather have the workbench space, you know, 
Um, although I did run them both a couple times and it was pretty cool. I love running <laughs> I, multiple I wanted... machines at once. It's like this high that I just like, I've got all this multitasking. I feel like my brain's just made for that. But, you know, it's, if it's, um, it, it just depends on what your workflow is, you know, like with Kaizen, right. I'm sure they could fit, yeah. you know, two more machines and still have enough work to keep going, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just have that big enough of a, I mean, I, and I don't have the electricity. Like when you start having the, like the, all that stuff the running, I just start barn. losing electricity. Yeah, but uh, so it, what, what I just, I hated that I was seeing that machine just sit there and I wanted mm -hmm. to see it get used. So these, these two young men are, are using the heck out of it from what I've seen. They're starting to really do some interesting stuff, you know. Uh, so it's good to see. So they're the young, it's spelled J-U-N-G-E. Uh, makers is how you can find them on the social medias and see what they're Yeah, we'll to. put a link in the description here to, to some of their videos. And awesome. uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, Brody isn't just trying to use the CNC. He's trying to uh, 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 leverage it in order to establish a final product that would be really hard to, to manufacture potentially without a CNC or, or with traditional tools. Um, and it's definitely picking some interesting and uh, a fun project so definitely worth checking out yeah indeed it's been impressive to see kind of what they're doing and then also just watching all the different uh makers that we follow bring their kids into the shop you know i know you've been doing that for years but it's so new to a lot of different folks and um, if you're makers then you know your kids are just kind of naturally in the shop more but as we have more time for that it's it's cool to see that this generation is going to be so ready for, you know, like we're trying, we're kind of at a place where um, you're integrating digital fabrication later in your kind of shop make career. And then, but there are some, these kids are starting out with that. And so I'm really excited to see kind of where they take it in the future. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. That was, that was what got me using this stuff is I, I honestly had no interest in it. And, um, but I was, my son Vance was so interested in woodworking in the wood shop. I realized that if I didn't learn it to teach him that I was basically just setting him up for failure in the future. Cause I was just seeing the revolution come. And so I was like, okay, the reason I didn't want to do it is because I didn't want to learn. I wanted to be, I was being lazy and I thought I couldn't, you know right. what I mean? Like you just well, it's like, intimidating. It, it's, it is. I don't view it as laziness Tim. I just view it as intimidating. Just like I'm intimidated to pick up a musical instrument and strum it in front of you. It, it, it's, you know, I view you as really, good musician and I, and I am not. And, and I guess it's more just embrace that intimidation and uh, move past that, that failure, uh, uh, you know, or fear of failure and have fun, right? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, exactly. So, uh, exactly. And you know what, I love, and I love giving that to other people on YouTube. Like I learned to use the CNC on my YouTube channel and, yeah. and I, you know, I like being able to help other people like get over that and just go, go try it. And it's, it changed my world. You know, it made me a better at everything I do yeah. in here. You know? uh, William uh, Lutz has a question about, you know, would we recommend a small desktop CNC uh, for newbies? Um, I, honestly, many, many of our oh, customers are, are green. You know, they have never had a CNC. It's a real question. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I heard, I heard the name and I got <laughs> nervous. <laughs> uh, it is a very valid question. You know, I think... Um, I, I understand, you know, having a more introductory level machine um, can kind of help you determine whether or not this is a workflow that is going to be good for you. But I honestly could say that I think it's uh, if you are a traditional woodworker and you work with large sheets of material, starting with a pro series versus a benchtop machine. Um, they're going to be the same difficulty to learn. Um, and if you're working with larger sheets anyway, it kind of just makes sense for your workflow. I'm, I can say pretty confidently as somebody who has worked in production CNC fabrication um, and production laser fabrication, you know, the scale is only going to help you. Um, I don't think that that makes, determines, it, determines whether it's easy or not to learn. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so William Lutz, by the way, is one of the co-hosts of my favorite podcast, the Reclaimed Audio oh. Podcast. <laughs> People don't know that, and um, and also my my number one uh, stalker slash instigator or whatever 
<laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I think it depends on your budget and your mm-hmm. space, right? I mean, you know, if you don't, if you can't afford a giant machine, then obviously you can't start with a giant machine. And if you don't have the space for a giant machine, you can't. But yeah, if you're, if you work in plywood, there's no point in buying a two foot by two foot CNC machine. Right. Like that just doesn't make any sense. You know, you yeah. could uh, yeah, no, start I, with a four by two and then it, you know, it's still a relatively small footprint and then grow that machine later on to four by eight and then you can fit the full sheet of plywood, but you're still working with a smaller budget. Sorry, Corey, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, I was just going to agree with Tim. You know, it constraints are, are, are the two factors I would also, you know, budget and space. And I was watching Jay's, Jay Bates uh, blog or vlog today, and he was saying he wanted to do a, a shop tour, but instead of calling it the shop tour 2020, he wants to call it the ninth year shop tour because as woodworkers, we're always working with, constraints of budget and space like this isn't uh, uh, something that will be a static choice with this one machine as a maker we're always trying to stretch uh, those constraints of budget and space in order to allow us to have more tools so we can operate with higher efficiencies or lower liabilities and so when Jay said like instead of doing a shop tour 2020 I'm going to do a shop tour ninth year and I'm going to present it more as this is you know almost a decade of building this shop, not necessarily, here's a shop that you should be jealous of. Right. And I really liked that, that thought and approach. I, I get that comment a lot. And, and I have this one particular video and I, the, the title of the video is one pallet comma one guitar. So like, it, and it went viral. So the number one comment I get is one pallet, one guitar, $100,000 in tools, or, or some, some variation on that, you know? And, uh, and so I, I just, I always reply back like, yeah, man, invest in yourself. You know, like I go watch my first video. I had a, I had a skill saw and a cordless drill and I was in my wife's half of the garage and she, you know, like, like working next to her bumper. Like that's, you know, that's where you get, I'm, I'm there now. Like you can be there too. If every time you make something and you make money with it, you put that money right back into the business. And that's yeah. Ninth year is exactly like the right way to put it. Like, I mean, I never would have imagined that my shop would look like it does now. And I have no idea what it's going to look like in nine years from now, you know? Yeah. So I guess my answer to the, is a benchtop machine right for you? Well, if it fits your current constraints of budget and space, then yeah. It, uh, using digital fabrication is the right move, I feel like. And if, if your budget allows for a, a, an entry-level machine or a benchtop machine uh, or or if your space constraints allows for you to only have like a shaper origin or something like that, like, yeah, get into it, understand it, become an authority in how these tools remove material and how you hold material because you can leverage the knowledge you gain with those simpler or smaller tools into the bigger tools. And that's progressive learning. I will beat that drum constantly because it's the best way to learn because it's, it's you know, that that is learning through knowledge. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, we're at just over an hour here, so I don't want to be the killer of a good time, but I do want to recognize that we're, we're, we're just over an hour here. So I guess if there's any final questions that uh, people are interested, uh, throw them in the chat um, and, and uh, we'll, we'll throw them here at Tim at the last minute. But Tim, I guess to open open up the door for you, is there any anything else you'd like to review or is there anything you'd like to point people towards into in regards to new tips or tricks or products that you're developing have available? Um, no, I, well, I mean, just, you know, thanks, thanks for doing this, I guess. Um, you know, I, I appreciate it hanging out with you guys all the time and it's nice to see you and do that as far as, you know, what I'm doing. If you just, you know, my YouTube channel is just my name, Tim Sway. You can see what's going on there. I have, um, you know, for the truck, I am, I'm doing like a vlog basically of the truck and uh, as it as it goes, so you can kind of follow along with that. And um, I have uh, soon I will have my I, 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 last year I developed a DIY guitar kit. So what I do is I, I source and package parts that work together and I have some files and uh, instructional video like that's like behind a, a paywall. And uh, templates like router templates for people that don't have CNCs, and then PDF mm-hmm. files and stuff for people that do have CNCs to make their own guitar body, and then all the parts are there. And the the the, the day I launched the video, like within the first couple comments, is like you have a base kit, 
And uh, no, I don't, <laughs> but I will soon. <laughs> it took me about a year, but um, I, I said, if I sell enough of the guitar kits to where it makes sense to keep doing this, I will, I will incorporate a bass kit. And so I, yeah. I, I ended up, um, I, I can't make the next here myself because uh, I'm just too small of a shop and would get too expensive. And so I, I sourced them. And I think I sent you, Corey, a picture of it when um, mm -hmm. I sourced them to a factory overseas where they made these next to my specs and they're, they're awesome. Yeah. And uh, he sent me a picture of the machine that he does them on. It's basically just like a, a four by CNC router, you know, like, like your machine. But instead of one spindle, it has like eight of them. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's just like a, like a copier as it goes. And it makes eight at a time. So cool. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. You know, again, like I need it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but so I, I'm going to be having those kits soon. And I was hoping to have them ready by now. But, but because of COVID and everything, everything's just taking longer. Um, but they will be there soon. So that's cool. Well, good. Pete, that's an easy way for you to tell your friend you can help him uh, build a guitar uh, is you can you can buy the neck and, and the other parts from Tim and, and uh, you can pass them off as your yeah, go support your favorite makers. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, one last and final yeah. very important question. Uh, the great Alexander wants to know, and I think there's a lot of uh, accurate answers here uh, in the chat. What is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? Well, we all know the answer is 42. <laughs> Obviously. But the question is... But what is the question? <laughs> um, yeah, that's exactly that's the problem. The meaning of life is to enjoy it and to leave the place a little bit better when you go. That's, that's, I think it's really that simple. Enjoy every minute of it and leave, leave things a little better than how they, you found Well, them. that is the perfect note. Thank you so much, Tim, for being with us here today. I feel enlightened and excited to go make some things in the shop. Um, we really appreciate having you here and uh, seeing all the things that you make. Thank you very much. It's good to see you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Here we go. Thanks, everyone, for being here. We'll see you later. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Join us next <laughs> Bye. week. Bye.